before I begin, I just want to say a few words of thanks. Uh, first, of course, to Dr. Gwaltney for bringing us all here, and also to Belmont University for providing us with this opportunity, and also to the Academy of Preachers uh, for this opportunity to, again, be here and to be encouraged and strengthened and have this sort of community with one another. Uh, again, my name is Jackson Roweeder, and let's open with a time of prayer. Awesome and amazing Lord, we praise you for your word, which surpasses the test of time. We thank you for this opportunity to gather with one another, to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, and to grow in our understanding of your divine love. I pray that the words that these people hear would not be mine, but would be yours and yours alone. Help me to get out of the way, Lord, as this is for your glory, not mine. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So my sermon is titled, The Greatest Hope, and our text today is going to come from Psalm 71. So if you have your Bible, or if you want to open up your device, feel free to do that. And I'm going to be preaching on the whole psalm, but for the sake of time, I'm only going to be reading verses 4 through 8, and verses 13 through 16. And I'll be reading from the NIV. 71 verse 4. Deliver me, O my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of evil and cruel men. For you have been my hope, O sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. From birth I have relied on you. You brought me forth from my mother's womb, and I will ever praise you. I have become like a portent to many, but you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise, declaring your splendor all day long. Skipping to verse 13. May my accusers perish in shame, and may those who want to harm me be covered with scorn and disgrace. But as for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteousness, of your salvation all day long, though I know not its measure. I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, O sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteousness and yours alone. Hope is one of those topics that we don't really talk about much in our daily lives or in our interactions with others outside of the church. This may be because we want to be self-sufficient creatures who aren't dependent on anything, or maybe we seek to go through life as our own little god. Or maybe on the other hand, we just simply aren't paying attention to where we place our hope. But if we take the time to stop and think, hope is something that we all want and something that we all need. As humans, we find ourselves constantly looking to the future for excitement and anticipation of what's to come. We make plans and dream of the possibilities that the unknown future lies ahead. And if we really take a close look at our human nature, it's clear to see that we as human beings are creatures of hope. The question, rather, is where or who do we put our hope in? I mean, think about it. In our daily actions, we're consistently trying to glorify something. We want to give praise and honor where we think it's due, whether it be our families, our friendships, success, or ourselves. We cling to these things and look to them as answers to our problems. And eventually, these small and frail hopes become our purpose and even our idols, taking the spotlight off of God and onto themselves. And I'll be the first to say that I'm guilty of this. I like to put things above God to prove to myself that I don't need anyone or anything. But the truth is that you and I can never run from our own brokenness and dependence on God. We can only press into it. When we put our hope in these earthly temporary things, we are continually let down by their lack of stability and failure to fill us up. Plans fall through, friends make mistakes, and success doesn't gratify us as much as we thought it would. From there, we go back to square one, seeking something new to try to put our hope in. And this is the cycle that many people who don't know God or don't follow God go through every day. It's a constant struggle of never feeling fulfilled or good enough that rages on. It's no wonder that many creatures of hope have become hopeless. But what if we put our hope in something that wasn't temporary? What if even further, we were made as these hoping creatures to put our hope in the one true God? I think it's important to start by defining what hope is and what it means to put in in God. Hope is defined as looking forward with confidence to a future good. 
Nowadays, though, it seems to be one of those words that we throw around with little meaning, similar to the word love. I love God, but I also love pizza. And in the same way, I hope we have spaghetti for dinner, but I also hope for the second coming of Jesus. Are these the same loves, the same hopes? Hope in the true sense of the word is the opposite of seeing or possessing. It is a conviction so strong that it is not dependent on what appears to the naked eye. Rather, hope is a testament to faith and believing what is without a direct confirmation. This true hope influences how we live our lives. It shapes our words, guides our actions, and defines who we are. Yeah, what we hope defines who we are. We can't deny that. As I said before, putting our hope in futile things is easy. As humans, we have a tendency to see these innately sinful things as these shiny objects that the enemy uses to try to lure us away from God and toward idols. Keeping our hope solely on God may be a challenge in this life, but the harvest is far greater than the labor. This is exactly what we see in our text today. One person, our psalmist, who has placed their hope entirely in God Almighty. We are not sure who the author of our psalm is. However, we do know a few things about them. The first is that they are of an older age and have faced many trials throughout the course of their life. We can see this by looking at verses 9 and 18, where the psalmist references being old, and in verse 6, where the author explains how he needed God since his birth. The author is likely near the end of his life, end of their life, excuse me, and is calling upon the Lord for possibly a final time. The main story of of the psalm is our author facing extreme adversity and persecution and crying to God in the midst of it. The psalmist claims that he is suffering under the hand of the wicked and the grasp of the evil in verse 4, and that he is suffering harm in verse 13. And, And while we are not told the exact specifications of this opposition, the point is clear. The psalmist is fighting a difficult battle, regardless of what the opposition is. In most lament psalms, They usually begin by describing the opposition that the author is facing in the first few verses, and then moving into a time of assurance and praise to God in spite of the opposition. What is unique about Psalm 71 is that the psalmist makes a point to describe their suffering not just once, but three times. By doing so, the author shows the weight of what they're really going through. Has anyone here faced a trial that just doesn't ever seem to let up? Been attacked by the enemy repeatedly without relent or looked down upon for your faith or judged for what you believe. However, after each petition of persecution in the psalm, the psalmist responds with praise and honor given to God upon high. No, they don't sulk, complain, or declare that God has left them. They don't hold a grudge against God or question his plans. No, the psalmist worships, looking straight into the face of persecution The psalmist worships. This is for two reasons. The first is that the psalmist knows that the reality of God is not dependent on what we see in the physical world right in front of us. That is to say that God is not only real if he works a miracle right here and now. For we are not to put our Lord God to the test, as Deuteronomy 6, and we are to trust that God's timing is perfect because to the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day, says 2 Peter 3. God is God, whether I see him moving or not, and he is good, whether we believe it or not. Pastor Stephen Furtick from Elevation Church says that God's kingdom doesn't work like a courtroom. That is, the evidence doesn't precede the verdict. Because in the courtroom, you need evidence to make a claim about a particular person or event. By faith, however, the verdict comes first and the evidence comes second. That's to say, I know God is a refuge for those who are put to shame. I know God is loving me even when I don't see it. And I don't need him to show up for me to believe that. And I know that God loves me. I don't have to physically see that. Which leads me to my second point. The psalmist knows who God truly is. They know first that God is sovereign, reigning over all things with nothing too big or small for him. Colossians 1.17 says that he is before all things, And in him, all things hold together. But there's even more to the story. See, sovereignty could not necessarily be a good thing if we served a God who was malicious or deceitful. But we don't. We serve a God whose love cannot be explained by words or sentences. 
a God who works to make all things work together for our good. We serve a God who created the world not because he had to, but because he wanted to pour his love out across the earth. We serve a God who can never be dismantled from his throne in heaven. It is this, the very nature of who God is, that allows us to have such confidence and hope in him. If you remember at the beginning, I talked about how easily we put our hope in the wrong things, how we choose other things over God with the expectation that we'll be satisfied. Psalm 71 refutes us in our wandering and shows us the immense power of putting our hope in God alone. When it's laid out like this in the psalm, it almost seems as if that's the only real way to respond to any kind of adversity, to look at it straight in the face and sing praises to God for his goodness and sovereignty. And because of this, we praise God for his calling of the biblical characters before us, people that have served as examples and testimonies to the goodness and mercy of God, because at the end of the day, God's goodness, sovereignty, provision over the world and nature stir up in us this divine God-inspired hope that is strong enough to overcome any sort of trials that we face. So brothers and sisters in Christ, put your hope in the one true God, for he will never leave or forsake you, and he is sovereign over all things, reigning with peace, love, and justice. To sort of wrap up my message, I would like to make one more point about what happens when we put our hope fully in God. If you remember back to when I started, I said that the psalmist didn't believe that God left him when he faced persecution. He didn't sulk or complain, but instead he worshiped. After describing their persecution and excuse me, opposition, they say in verse 19, your righteousness reaches to the skies, O God, you who have done great things. And check out verse 22 and 23. I will praise you with the harp for your faithfulness, my God. I will praise you with a lyre, O Holy One of Israel. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praise to you, I whom you have delivered. His hope in the Lord was so strong that it overflowed into songs of worship. Because when we understand the confidence we have when we put our hope in God, all we can do is praise. But it doesn't just stop there. This true hope that comes from God's nature doesn't only produce worship in the form of song for a few moments. It produces a true lifestyle of worship. Romans 12.1 says that we must surrender ourselves to God to be his sacred living sacrifices and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his heart. For this becomes your genuine expression of worship. It works like this. True hope in God creates an abundant life of worship, which then increases our hope all the more. You see, it's a cycle. The cycle goes like this, no matter what we face, we have hope in the sovereignty and goodness of God, and then from that hope comes worship, and that worship stirs our hope and leads us to a deeper understanding of the goodness of God. I'll say it one more time. The cycle goes like this, no matter what we face, we have hope in the goodness and sovereignty of God, and then from that hope comes worship, and that worship stirs our hope and leads us to a deeper understanding of the goodness of God. Hope and worship go hand in hand, and together produce a life of discipleship and servitude that no trials or persecution can ever stop. The New Living Translation puts it this way in verse 6. It's no wonder I'm always praising you. So people of God, called by God, I encourage you to have hope in the goodness, sovereignty, and mercy of Jesus Christ. Do not forget God's sovereignty, God's character, God's nature. Fight for your hope. And fight for your joy and don't let anything steal that away from you. Cling to the promises of the Lord and let your hope produce a life of true worship and intimacy with God. And may that life of worship only deepen your hope in God's nature as the Lord of heaven and earth. May we be like the psalmist, unwavering in our hope no matter the circumstances of what we face. When we face temptation that is so strong it makes us want to break, may we stand firm in the hope of God. When we get shot down for our faith, persecuted for preaching, silenced for loving, may we stand firm in the hope of God. When we get negative doctor's reports, when we battle depression or feel the creeping anxiety in the middle of the night, may we stand firm in the hope of God. When we fear climate change and the future of planet Earth, may we stand firm in the hope of God. And when we turn on the TV and hear the news of yet another mass shooting, may we stand firm in the hope of God. And may this hope overflow in us as our spiritual form of worship and surrender to the plans and purposes of God the Father, who loves us and who sent his son Jesus Christ as an example for us to follow. In him is our true hope, 
that God will never leave or forsake us, that we can never run from his presence, and that he makes all things work together for our good. To him be all the honor and the glory forever and ever. Amen.